while back, I did a video on the vintage children's fantasy books that I have in my collection. Like most kids, I loved fantasy, and so did one of my children anyway. But as a kid, I actually read more historical and realistic fiction than I did fantasy. I'm going to start today with the books that I read for the first time after I became an adult and then work my way back to the book that I read first and that is still to this day one of my favorite books I've ever read. Hi there, I'm Linda Maxey the author of the Library Land Guides to Nonfiction, and a fiction author in the making. I own a lot of books, and I've read even more. Some of the books I own are vintage, but most are not. But the books I'm going to share with you today are all the books that I've read and loved at different points in my life, and I'm quite pleased with the copies that I have of all of them. If you think of realistic fiction books that you adored as a kid, let me know in the comments below. If we all share, we might find that we share a lot of the same favorites. And we might also find some new favorites. I don't know about you, but I've always loved a good children's novel. There's just something about it that makes me feel secure and hopeful and happy. And I've kept notebooks about my reading and what was going on in my life off and on since I was in middle school. Here are just a few of the notebooks that I've kept. If you like to do the same and you're particular about your writing tools, Bastian sent me one of these ink pens in a lot of colors. I don't know if you can see that, but it's absolutely a beautiful shade of red. They also have these ink pens in stainless steel and titanium, and they have the aluminum ones like I have in a slew of beautiful colors. The cartridges are replaceable, and that makes them ecologically friendly, which is always a plus. If you'd like to order one, use the link in the description box below and use Linda20 in the coupon box to get a 20% discount on your purchase. Again, the details are in the description box below. I can't remember exactly when I read this first book, but I'm willing to bet it was while I was a graduate student in the 1990s. I took a class in children's literature because I had a choice between children's literature and young adult literature, and at the time I was working in an elementary school library, so children's literature was a better fit. We had to read 100 books. That, that came out to about a book a day. It was insane. At any rate, I really wish that I had decided discovered this book sooner, and I immediately fell in love with it. The book is Anne of Green Gables by L. M. Montgomery. Most of you are probably familiar with Anne Shirley, the red-headed orphan who comes to stay with an unmarried brother and sister on Prince Edward Island around the turn of the 20th century. Honestly, I wasn't expecting much from this book, but since it was a classic, I felt like I needed to read it. I had heard of Anne and expected her to be a less plucky version of Pippi Longstocking. She does have an outgoing and friendly personality. I've never actually read Pippi Longstocking, to be fair. I've only seen the movie, so I may be judging her her a little harshly, but she never really appealed to me as a character. I never identified with kids who were free to do exactly what they wanted to do, and frankly, they scared me a little. But I was pleased and touched to find that while Anne is enthusiastic and adventurous, she also really just wants love. Just like Matthew and Marilla Cuthbert, I couldn't help but love her. Anne goes to live with this odd couple who live on a beautiful and well-maintained farm in Nova Scotia. She gets along well from the start with the brother, Matthew, but she and the sister, Marilla, struggle to understand one another. Anne's enthusiasm gets her into various troubles, and with no guarantee that the Cuthberts will be willing to keep her, these are serious, much more serious than your average childhood scrape. I won't reveal the end in case anyone listening doesn't know what happens, but I, like most people, fell completely in love with the character of Anne Shirley. Oddly enough, I never went on to read a single one of the sequels that follow her as she grows up. I did purchase the entire set of the Emily books that were written by Montgomery. Emily is a more autobiographical character, and I've seen people comment that they prefer her to Anne. And while I found Emily interesting, I didn't like her as much as Anne. She's more dramatic than Anne, and the books, to me, read like a soap opera. Personal preference, of course, but 
I think both characters are well developed. Montgomery was a good writer. I bought this copy at a used bookstore and it's a Reader's Digest edition and is illustrated by Mick Ellison and the copyright date is 1992. Moving on to another book that I first read in graduate school when I was around 30 years old is The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. I tried to read this book when I was younger, but from the first I developed a dislike for Mary, the main character. And she is an unlikable child in the first few chapters. But that's the great appeal of the book because once you get past the first few disagreeable chapters, you see her character transform before your eyes just like the garden in the title. I picked up this copy at the UNC, that's University of North Carolina Greensboro bookstore. Evidently, they were having a book sale or something. I don't remember doing this, but the receipt is in the book and that's where it's from and it's dated 1991 while I was a student there. I evidently paid $4 for it, which was a lot for a used book back then, but I'm so glad I did. Look at the end papers. The book was published in 1911, but the edition I have was published in 1962 by J.B. Lippincott, and the illustrations are by Tasha Tudor. I adore this book. It's a beautiful story, beautifully told, with stellar illustrations. The next two books I'll show you are books that I read for the first time when I was in seventh grade. Both of them were recommended to me by my friend Suzanne, who I thought was one of the coolest people I'd ever met. If Suzanne recommended a book to me, I read it. The first I read near the beginning of my seventh grade year, and I would consider this book a classic at this point. The book is Harriet the Spy by Louise Fitzhugh. This book inspired me to become a spy myself. I wonder if any of you did things like that when you were young too. I was 12 and felt deeply uncomfortable with the changes that were taking place in both me and my classmates. That Harriet was going around neighborhoods with a spy notebook every day after school, creeping into people's houses to spy on them and record her thoughts about what they did in a notebook seemed both independent and brave to me. She lived on her own terms, but she did pay a high price for that. But I do think my key to the enjoyment of the book was the feeling of being thrust into a grown-up world with grown-up activities that I felt completely unprepared to deal with. And isn't that one of the reasons that kids and adults should read? To help us deal with scary situations with more intelligence and skill? Harriet attended a small private school in Manhattan. It's her sixth grade year, and she's not close to her parents, but she's very close to the governess she's had since she was small, Miss Golly, whom Harriet calls Old Golly. Tragedy strikes when Old Golly gets married and leaves, but then it compounds when her friends find her notebook and read all the mean things that she said about them. At one point, Harriet notes with dismay, everybody hates me. Who hasn't been there? My brother bought me a copy of this book at a book sale when he was in the United Kingdom. It was a U.S. copy published by Harper and Rowe in 1964. This does seem to be a first edition. Here's the inscription my brother placed in the book when he gave it to me in 1989. It says, Linda, after all the years, I thought this book might still have a special place in your library. All my love. Who wouldn't treasure something like that? The next book was recommended to me by Suzanne as well, and I first read it in seventh grade, right around the time I turned 13, so it was closer to the end of the school year. The book is Who Wants Music on Monday, and it's by Mary Stoltz. Mary Stoltz wrote books for adults, teens, and children, but most were for children and teens. Many of you may have heard of A Dog on Barkham Street and The Bully of Barkham Street. She also wrote In a Mirror, which I read around the same time. This book was published in 19. 63, which was just the year after I was born. It's about a family with a brother away at college, a father who works as a traveling salesman, and a mother who favors her older daughter and struggles to understand her younger one. The older sister, Lada, is 17. She's a high school senior who is traditionally feminine, pretty, and has suitors galore. Her younger sister, Cassie, is 15, odd-looking in her own estimation, and is interested in art and learning. The two sisters share a room and that's about it. 
Things reach a crisis when they both develop a crush on the same boy. At the same time, Cassie adored her older brother, Vincent, but he's having struggles of his own. I love this book because of the characters and because I could identify with the younger sister, Cassie. Reading this book, like reading about Harriet, made me feel less alone. But the other thing this book did for me was give me hints as to what life might have in store in the years ahead. I was the oldest child in my family and was scared about my future high school and college. Okay, the final book I'll talk about is a classic that I really wish all kids, boys and girls, could be required to read. It's Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. My parents brought me an abbreviated edition of the book for my 10th birthday. I loved all four of the March sisters immediately and read the book over and over again. For Christmas that year, I asked them to please get me an unabridged copy, and I'm glad to say that they did. That's the copy I showed you. I no longer had the dust jacket for this book, and I have no idea what happened to it. I really wish I still had it. But even the cover of this book without it is beautiful to my eyes. This edition of the book is a reprint of a 1947 edition of the book by Grosset and Dunlap. It was published in 1974. The illustrations are by Louis Jambour. Look at the end papers. And here are a few illustrations. I loved this book from the start because Louisa May Alcott is a truly gifted writer. The characters she created were based on somewhat on her own family, but each and every one of them comes alive in the reading. I've read several biographies of Louisa May Alcott, and I know that though Little Women talks a lot about the poverty of the March family in the book, their poverty is nothing compared to what the Alcott family went through. Her father, Branson Alcott, was one of those people that fit into the same too heavenly minded to be any earth earthly good, at least as far as the family was concerned. He was one of the American transcendentalists in New England, and the family were friends with luminaries like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. But without Louisa's writing, the family would likely have wound up destitute. Even though she was writing about a time 170 years in the past, most people, I think, can still relate to the problems and the issues the girls experience. Here is one of the fun things for me. Most girls can identify with the, at least one of the sisters, and most girls have a favorite character. It might be the same character and they might be different. Many like Jo the best or want to be like her because she never let being a girl get in the way of anything she wanted to do. The character that represents Louisa's personality is Jo. I liked all of them, but I already felt I was a lot like Jo. So oddly enough, when I was a kid, she wasn't the most interesting character to me. Instead, I was taken with Beth. Beth was the shy, sweet, quiet sister who was musical and genuinely wanted to take care of other people. Except for this shyness, we were nothing alike. But I think I got the idea that it was okay to be different, that shyness didn't make you weird or bad from reading about Beth. I went on to read Little Women and Joe's Boys. While I liked both books, Neither held a candle to Little Women for me. This book is, and probably always will be, one of my favorite books. I've likely read it 20 times, and the last time I read it was almost 30 years ago when my oldest son was a baby. I think it's time I read it again and see if it's as good as I remember and if I can still glean any new insights from it. So I hope you enjoyed this video. It was a real trip down memory lane for me, and I was happy to produce it. And until next time, Happy reading.